and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. A Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? As we light the fourth candle of Advent, we recognize the gift of peace that is offered to all mankind through, the, through, the, through Jesus, the Son of God. Luke 1, 28 to 33. And he, the angel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er oh, the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strains Gloria In excelsis day Oh. 
Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the glad some tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song? I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. There's a lot of things that you could be doing, but you chose to gather with us to worship our Lord. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father God, as we enter another week of Advent, another week of anticipation, of celebration of the gift of your Son, Father, we are grateful that we live in a country where we have the freedoms to do so. And Father, help us as your children to be able to spread the good news that came that Christmas morn. Father, accept our praise that we give to you this morning. And Father, we ask that you just touch our hearts and help us to receive what you have for us this morning. But Father, our greatest desire is to worship and glorify your holy name. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. We have a couple of announcements I want to give you. The regular things that we go on, you know, are, are continuing. But just a reminder, one more week until next Sunday, we'll be collecting new and gently used hats, gloves, scarves, and socks that are needed to benefit the local homeless community this winter. And we hope to be able to get those to them um, the week following uh, Christmas. So if you're able to help that, we have a barrel in the side room. If you need someone to come pick them up, you can give one of the ladies, because this is sponsored by the ladies group, give one of the ladies in the ladies group a call, and they will be glad to come out and pick them up for you. 
If you haven't done so already, uh, the 2022 Bible reading plans are available. For those of you online, uh, you can. Uh, I will put a link in the description underneath our um, YouTube video down below, and you can click on that link, and you can uh, download it. Or you can give me a call, and I will be gladly get one to you. This afternoon, we're going Christmas caroling. Following Christmas caroling, we're gathering here uh, for soup. And so uh, we look forward to that, and we hope to be able to share the Christmas cheer with those who would love to be able to hear it. And this Friday, 6.30 p.m. here at the church, we're having our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Not only are we going to have a time of lighting the light of Christ and sharing it with each other, we'll have a time of communion, singing some beautiful Christmas carols, and hearing a Christmas story. We have all of that coming forward to us this Friday at 6.30 p.m. We also have a couple birthdays that we'd like to remember and celebrate. The first is Bella Zarate's birthday is this Thursday. And of course, we cannot forget that we are celebrating the birthday of Jesus on this Saturday. Uh, so please remember and praise those. And Bella, we have this song for you. It's your birthday and we celebrate the day you were born, the life that God gave. Yeah, it's your birthday and we are all here, thanking the Lord for giving you one more year. Blow out your candles and say a prayer, as for God's plan our wishes never compare. The next 365 days, may you daily open the gift of God's grace.
While by the sheep we watch at night, glad tidings brought an angel bright. How great our joy, great our joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord. There shall be born, so he did say, in Bethlehem, a child today. How great our joy, great our joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high, praise we the Lord.
Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. No chevy As we break this bread, as we drink this cup, Lord, we remember how you gave your life on a brutal cross. Lord, we remember this is the way you've chosen to save. This is the way you make all things new. This is the way you've chosen to say. This is the way you make all things new, broken and beautiful, extravagant love. Prodigal grace, broken and beautiful. God's perfect justice, mercy's embrace. As we break this bread, as we drink this cup, Lord, we remember. It was for my sin that your flesh was torn. Lord, we remember this is the way you've chosen to say. This is the way you make all things new. And this is the way you've chosen to say. Good morning, church. Beautiful morning to be in the house of the Lord. I'd like to share with you from Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming like in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, 
even the death of the cross. This is the story of Jesus. It is a story how God's son loved people more than his place in glory. It is a story of how Jesus embraced human limitations to do what no human being could do. Settled the sin issue between God and people. It is a story of how Jesus humbled himself. Humility, the setting aside of self for the benefit and betterment of another. It mirrors true love in both definition and description. But humility is not the sacrifice of self that is the hallmark of true love. Humility is the assertion of the truly redeemed self, free of presence and falsehood, devoid of any tendency to please others, acting with the purest motives, doing what only one individual can do in one moment. That's what Jesus did. That's what he calls us to do today. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Mind, attitude, rationale, motivation, perspective, all these direct your thoughts and actions toward Christ-like living. That is, as of us, indicates that, it's, that it is possible for us. Dear God, by transforming the power of your Holy Spirit, enable me to think and act with true humility today. For your glory, help me be just like Jesus. Amen. Would you repeat with me the good confession? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God.
if you haven't heard yet, it's six more days to Christmas. This Saturday, we'll be celebrating the gift of Christ. Christmas trees are up. Presents are beginning to be piled under them, wrapped up in cute, pretty, fancy, funny, religious, all kinds of wrapping paper. For most of us, a lot of thought goes into both the choice of the gift as well as the wrapping paper. Truth be told, gifts and Christmas go together in our minds. Many believe that it's because of the gifts of the wise men, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. But you know, I don't. I don't think that it's because of those gifts. I think it's because of another gift that was given. The gift that was given on that first Christmas day. John 3, 16, which many of us have known by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That gift, that Christmas gift, was wrapped up in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, and 33 years was unwrapped on a cross where he gave his life for you and I. One of the hallmarks of the Christmas life is giving. Giving of time, talents, and treasures. The perfect picture of what Jesus gave us. Each week, we, um, we, like Christians throughout the world, give towards the ministry of our Lord. We do so remembering what he gave us. Not the child in the manger, but the son on the cross. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity we have this morning to give back to you just a token of what you've given us. Father, we give to you freely. We give to you with open heart. We give to you because of our love for you. Father, I ask that you take the gifts that are given this week and use them to glorify your kingdom so people can know about the true gift that you gave us through your son. Father, we love you. We thank you. In your son's holy and precious name, amen. As we come to our time of prayers and praises, I just want to share with you a couple of the praises that have come up. Uh, those that are praising the opportunity we have this afternoon to go and to share carols, Christmas carols with those in our community and within our church family. The opportunities we've had and will have to share about Jesus Christ during this Christmas season. And also a praise that came Friday morning. The missionaries, all of the missionaries that were kidnapped in Haiti have been returned and all of them are safe and we can praise God for that answered prayer. Some of the prayers that we came in, continue praying for those who are affected by the devastation uh, of the tornadoes in the Midwest with this crazy weather that we've been having. We also pray for those in our church family uh, with financial, emotional, spiritual, and physical needs. Many of you know them by name. And this week, remember to lift their name, them up by name. And also those will be traveling this week because of Christmas. And so we have those there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have each week to, to share to you what's on our hearts. And Father, we thank you, first of all, for the missionaries that are now home with their families for Christmas this year. Those that were kidnapped in Haiti, Father, and we are rejoice with you that they are home and safe. And the message of their love is still going to continue going. Their love for you and your love for them. Father, we thank you for the opportunities we have to share about Jesus Christ during this Christmas season. One of those times is going to be this afternoon when we go Christmas caroling, Father. And also the times that we share at the, with others in stores and places that we go. Father, we also want to continue lifting up to those who are having such a difficult time because of the tornadoes in the Midwest, losing of homes and businesses and, yes, even church buildings. But, Father, I ask that you be with the Christians in each of those communities, the Christians who are coming in to help, that they'll be able to continue to share your love so people to know how you, much you care and love them. 
Father, be with those in our church family. We have several with financial, emotional, spiritual, or physical needs. Father, you know each and every one. You know their needs and their, and their difficulties and their struggles more than I do. But Father, we lay them at your feet knowing that you will meet those needs. And Father, be with those who are traveling this week. Some traveling here, others traveling elsewhere to be with friends and family for Christmas. Father, we just pray that you keep them safe. And also as they travel, may they be able to continue to share your love. Father, be with us as we hear from your word. Allow the word that, is, that I speak be your words and allow me to, and my personality to step back so that you can resolve, see, receive all glory, honor, and praise. Father, we thank you and we praise you in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present, your whole, present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. During this Advent season, we have been looking at the real Christmas story. Some of you might have noticed that we've not been focusing so much on the traditional Christmas scriptures. Too often we get caught up with the pictures of Christmas, the nativity, the shepherds, the wise men, and yes, the baby lying in a manger. Yet the real meaning of Christmas is more than just a beautiful story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. It's about a God who loves us so much that he does what only he can do. Being, bring us restoration through his son and the cross. Let me go back and read that first verse of our text again. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The word for firstborn here does not mean that Jesus was created being <coughs> a created being as some cults would want us to believe. The word firstborn is an adjective, not a noun. It describes the order of inheritance. You see, in the Jewish culture, the firstborn is the one who receives a double portion of the estate. We, we talked about that last week. Creation was made by Jesus, the word of God, and, and Jesus' inheritance is all of creation. A creation that he would die on the cross to redeem. Again, Colossians 1, this time verse 20. Making peace through his shed blood on the cross. The real Christmas story is found in this truth by an anonymous poet. A baby born in Bethlehem, his hands soft and gently curled, but held within their dimpled grasp the hope of the entire world. The real Christmas story is the story of hope, peace, joy, and above all, love.
the creator of all things, visible and invisible, in heaven and on earth, the one who has authority over every throne, every power, every ruler, every authority, because it is created by him, sustained by him, held together by him. He was before all these things. So here's a biblical truth about Christmas. Jesus is in control. And do you see the picture? The word of creation became one of us, Emmanuel, so he could redeem us. God put his feet in our shoes so he could walk as an example for us to follow all the way to the cross and victoriously raised from an empty grave. Back to Colossians 1, this time verse 18. The firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. This is the Christmas story, the true story of Christmas. Christmas isn't the celebration of one day. It's not about crazy and hectic shopping and gift giving. The real story of Christmas is found in God's plan to save us, redeem us, restore us by becoming one of us. This is what the angel meant in Luke 2 when he tells the shepherds, don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. God's message to all of us is, hold on, I've got a plan. <clears throat> Don't you imagine being a 15, 16-year-old Jewish girl. You're not married yet. You're engaged to a carpenter. You have just been informed by an angel. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid. You're going to have a child, a baby boy. He will be called the son of the Most High. God will give him the throne of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. But there's a problem. And Mary knows it. We can see it in her very first question. How can this be? I am a virgin. So the angel tells her, the Holy Spirit will come, up, come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Which brings us to Mary's res remarkable response. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Have you ever thought about this? Mary had to experience the initial rejection of her fiancé. She was nearly divorced. She became an immigrant in her teens. And one day she would witness her firstborn's gruesome execution. If you ever wondered if God really was a good God with a good plan, I want you to stop and think about Mary. Have you realized that Mary was probably only in her mid-40s when she stood at the foot of the cross? She watched her oldest child be rejected, arrested, beaten, tortured, displayed out for the world to see, nailed there on a cross. How is this good news that would bring great joy to all the people, one might ask? Well, as she speaks his name from the foot of cross, Yeshua, Jesus, she remembers who it was that gave him that name. That name that means Savior. But also think how she, but also, she must think, how can this be true? How can he be a savior there on the cross? Terry Oski writes, From upon the cross, her Jesus, deserted by his brothers who mocked his messianic pretensions, speaks to her as his best friend stands at her side, 
Mom, John will take care of you. John, take care of my mom. From the manger to the cross, God has a plan. He was working in ways that no one could have imagined. He's making a way where there seems to be no way. None of us has been in that same place that Mary stood. But every one of us has been asked to hold on and trust God's plan. Our text records it this way in verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out from the gospel, hold on and trust God. The question is, will we trust God's supremacy? Will we believe he is in control? Will we keep the faith even when we are heartbroken, disappointed, and anxious? I firmly believe that our God turns the tears of night into joy in the morning. Faith is holding on, trusting that God is working for your good and to accomplish his plan. Do you remember what Romans 8.28 says? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to share a story. The story is about a king in Africa who had a close friend, which uh, a, a person he grew up with, been his friend for years. Now his friend had a habit of looking at every situation that occurred in his life, positive, negative, and remarking, this is good. One day the king and his friend were out on a hunting expedition. The friend would load and prepare the gun for the king. The friend had apparently done something wrong in preparing one of the guns. For after taking the gun from his friend, the king fired it and his thumb was blown off. Examining the situation, the friend remarked, as usual, this is good. To which the king replied, no, this is not good, and proceeded to send his friend to jail. About a year later, the king was out hunting in an area that he knew he should should stay clear of. Cannibals captured him and took him to their village. They tied his hand, stacked some wood, and set up a stake in the ground and bound him to that stake. As they came near to the fire, to set, the fire, set fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing a thumb. Being superstitious, they never ate anyone who was less than whole. So, Untying the king, they sent him on his way. As he returned home, he was reminded of the event that had taken his thumb and felt remorse for his treatment of his friend. He immediately went to the jail to speak to his friend. You were right, he said. It was good that my thumb was blown off. Releasing him, the king proceeded to tell the friend all that had happened. And so I'm very sorry for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad of me to do this. No, his friend replied. This is good. What do you mean this is good? How could it be good that I sent my friend to jail for a year? To which the friend replied, If I had not been in jail, I would have been with you. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. So, hold on. Trust God today because he is the only one who knows your tomorrows. I want you to listen again to verses 16 to 18 from our text. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. 
Jesus is before all things. He is the authority over everything, invisible, invisible, every power, every throne, every ruler. He holds it all together. So hold on. Trust him. He is supreme even when it comes to death. It is really what our Christian life is all about. Hebrews 11.6 tells us, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Each of us will have a time of testing. Each of us will wonder, how can God bring good from this? How can God work this out to accomplish his plan? Well, he's God. And he is working. He's good. And he is for us, not against us. So let me end with this truth. The Christmas story is the story of reconciliation and life. Again, verse 18. And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is God in the flesh, so that through him all things could be reconciled. How does Jesus reconcile everything in heaven and on earth? How does Jesus redeem his broken, sinful creation that is at war with God in their souls? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.20 tells us he does so by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. You see, that infant that Mary laid in a wooden manger was destined to be nailed to a wooden cross. This is the real Christmas story. God became flesh so he could die in our place. The moment Jesus breathed his last and said it is finished, the war with sin for every single person was won. And three days later when he rose from the dead, our greatest enemy, death, was defeated. Jesus stands in authority, King of kings and Lord of lords, and offers victory and peace to all. As we come to the end of this message, do not forget or diminish the reality he did this even though you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your behavior. He didn't wait for you to clean up your act before. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the rule for all mankind. All of us are sinners, fought with God for control because we wanted to live selfishly. And many millions still do. Many will until their very last breath. We'd rather live our own way in darkness instead of surrendering and making peace with God through Christ and walk in light. I know you're familiar with this verse. I read it earlier. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. One of the most well-known script verses in all of scripture. But I want you to listen. I'm not going to put them on the board, up on the screen. But I want you to listen to the five verses that follow it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus is the creator 
of life and light. He can penetrate the darkest soul. The most rebellious warrior can know peace. And the treaty that makes it happen is signed in his blood shed on the cross. In a moment, we're going to sing our song of commitment. The song is, God will make a way. And during the Christmas season, we see the evidence of a God who loved us while we were still his enemies. He sent his son as a baby wrapped in cloths, clothes, lied in a manger, who became the lamb on the cross to make a way for us to be redeemed. Listen to the words of this non-Christmas Christmas song. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, hold me closely to my side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. Let's sing, God will make a way. The real meaning of Christmas. The meaning of the cross and the manger. The manger was that in which how God delivered his son to go to the cross. As you drive around this week and look at the Christmas lights in people's yards, Look to see if there are any crosses in the yards. I've seen a couple. We like to remember the manger. But we need to proclaim the cross. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of Christmas. The gift of hope peace, joy, and love. The gift that came wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. But Father, we know that gift wasn't a baby. The gift was a Savior. The Savior who would walk in our shoes. Show us the way to Calvary. And then die for us there. Father, let us not just experience the Christmas that this world tries to show us. But he'll help us to experience and proclaim the Christmas 
that you gave us. Salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Father, we love you. We praise you. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.